one of the most startling verse of the Bible for me as I became a Christian for the first time many years ago was this verse that was found in Paul's letter to the Ephesians chapter 2 in verse 10 where Paul says that you are God's workmanship. I didn't understand it at first. What does it mean that I'm God's workmanship? Then Paul went on to say that we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works that He has prepared in advance for us to do. I didn't know what it means. I didn't have a clue. Um, and then a newer translation of the Bible came along called The Message, and it says that we are God's masterpiece. That's the word that Eugene Peterson, the person who did the message version of the Bible, Use. That's the word that he used, that we are God's workmanship. We are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus, and God has prepared in advance a great work for us to do. I believe that we are all meant for something great in this world. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter your past, but I believe in the truth of God's Word. I don't believe that you are here in this world just to take up space. I don't believe that you are here in this world because you're an accident. I don't believe that. I believe God wanted you exactly where you are right now, and God had prepared in advance a great work for us to do. So I'm very, very excited to be bringing you this series that we're calling We Could Be Heroes as we go through together for the next three weeks the book of Ephesians. But I know even as I said these words, a lot of thoughts came to your mind. A lot of thoughts came to my mind. How can I be a hero? How can I do something significant in this world when I can't even, you know, do what I'm responsible for right now? You know, I'm overwhelmed with my responsibility as a parent, as a worker, as a, as a, as a volunteer in the church. You know, I'm, I'm already overwhelmed as it is. What do you mean that I'm meant for something greater? Uh, I want to ask by... I want to start by asking you this question. Do you ever wonder why you do what you do? I was in a shop one time about to pay for a T-shirt when a thought suddenly occurred to me, I don't need another T-shirt. Why do I want to buy another T-shirt? I already have like 200 at home. Uh, I don't know if you ever felt like that. Maybe for you it's not T-shirt. Maybe for you it's handbag. Maybe for you it's shoes or gadget or car, you know, uh, whatever, whatever it is. Uh, have you been in a situation where you were in a conversation and you disagreed with someone and then you walked away um, after you put that person down a couple of notches? So you walked away thinking, hang on, what just happened? What did I do that for? What, what was in me that made it necessary for me to put someone down in order to prop myself up just a little bit? Why did I do that? You've been in a meeting where uh, you're, you're being misunderstood and then your blood started boiling, you know, your temperature started rising and your voice started to get louder and louder and finally you yelled at the top of your lung, no, 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 you're not understanding me. And then later on, you came back and you thought, what was so life and death in that situation that prompted me to be in, in a rage like that, you know? And, and you wonder, like, why did I do what I do? Uh, I don't mean to give you a very simplistic answer this evening, but I believe we behave like we behave because we think like we think. Let me say again. We behave like we behave because we think like we think. See, a lot of people try to change their behavior from the outside without realizing that the reason why they behave a certain way is because they think a certain way. See, if you want to make long-lasting long change in your life, you can't just change your outside behavior. You got to look within. You got to change the way you think. So for the next three weeks, we're going to answer these three huge questions that at one point or another, we all ask these questions. The first is, who am I? 
why am I here and how should I live? How should I live? I want to uh, ask you this. If you are stranded in a deserted island and, and only one book of the Bible can come, you know, wash ashore, what book would you like it to be? What book would you like it to be? Talk to me. Anybody? You don't care? As long as I have iPad and Wi-Fi, you know, I'm happy. I don't care about no book of the Bible. Just give me my iPad and Wi-Fi. Yes. Um, Psalm. Psalm is great. Lots of, lots of chapters, 150. Anybody else? How to build a boat. Yes. You're not listening very carefully, Pastor Michael. I said book of the Bible. You know, okay. <laughs> okay. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, the book of Jonah? Yeah, that's probably one. Okay. Um, for me, if I could choose only one book to read if I'm in a deserted island, I, it's going to be very hard to choose. But definitely, if I have five, <laughs> I'm cheating. One of them would be the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians has been called pound for pound the most influential book of the Bible. There are only a few other books of the Bible that are as influential as the book of Ephesians. That would be probably the book of Romans, but the book of Romans is 16 chapters long. Psalm is one of people's favorites, 150 chapters long. But the book of Ephesians actually is a letter to the Ephesians. It's only six chapters short. It's only six chapters. But in this short six chapters, it is full chock full of theological truth and practical insights for living. It's just unbelievable. So it's a privilege for all of us to be able to study this book together for the next three weeks. And I want to start, before we jump into Ephesians 1 verse 1, to introduce you the writer of this letter to the Ephesians. How many of you know who wrote the letter to the Ephesians? Who wrote it? John, Paul, or Ringo. <laughs> That's the beautiful. It's Paul, the Apostle Paul, all right? I want to tell you about him. I want to show you his picture. This is the picture of the Apostle Paul. Uh, selfie was invented in the 5th century, <laughs> as you can tell. <laughs> um, and he's very Asian, too, like, <laughs> right? Uh, but on a, truly, this uh, this is the first known painting of the Apostle Paul dated in the 5th century, found in Ephesus uh, of all places. And even for his time, Paul, he was pretty hip. You saw his iPad there at the bottom, wearing a hoodie. He's pretty cool. Actually, according to tradition, Paul, is not, uh, he was not a very handsome man. Um, he was very, very intelligent. He was very short, had crooked nose, slightly balding. And he was not the most charismatic leader either. There are a lot of other leaders who were more charismatic than him, like Peter, for example. And he was not the best preacher either. So people, when he came to town, sometimes complained that, oh, your preaching was not as good as your writing. You didn't preach very well, Paul. So that was Paul. And Paul, before he was Paul, his name was actually Saul. And yeah, he was the Apostle Paul, formerly known as Saul, just like, you know, uh, who, what was his name, the, the artist? Uh, Prince, yeah, or, or um, I'm thinking of somebody else, uh, somebody Lion. Whose name has Lion in the, in? Snoopy Lion, that's right. <laughs> Snoopy Lion, the artist formerly known as Snoopy Dog, right? <laughs> is it Snoopy Dog or Snoop Dog? <laughs> Snoop Dog. Snoopy is a different animal, right? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I know. I got it all mixed up. Snoopy Dog. How uncool is that? <laughs> Snoopy Dog, right? <laughs> um, anyway, so before Paul became an apostle, he was Saul. And let me tell you, Saul was evil. When I say evil, I mean evil. He was the kind of man who would drag a mother out of her house and kill her in front of her children and smile doing it. 
Paul, when he was younger, when he was in his 20s, 30s, his one mission in life is to destroy Christians from the face of the earth. That is his one mission in life. Like I said, he was very smart. He was the Pharisee of Pharisees, very zealous of his religion, which is Judaism. And he was the one who one day, when he was on his way to Damascus, trying to kill more Christians, he was confronted with the resurrected Jesus himself. He had this supernatural encounter where Jesus spoke to Paul, and Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Why do you persecute me? Saul fell to the ground. He became blind. And then God sent a person by the name of Ananias to come and see him, healed his eyes, and from that moment on, Paul spent every waking moment of his life to spread the good news of the resurrected Jesus. He literally traveled thousands and thousands of miles by foot, by sea, to plant churches everywhere. And in about AD 57, he planted the church in Ephesus. And you can read all the stories about Paul planting churches in the book of Acts. It's very, very interesting. So you've got to read your Bible from time to time. I want to show you the map of Ephesus so that you know where it is. On a map, you would locate Ephesus along the coastline of the Aegean Sea. It's in the western part of modern Turkey. And you see some of the famous landmarks there. You have Patmos. That's where the apostle John wrote the book of Revelation. You have Athens on the left, you have Troy, and then Istanbul, the capital city of Turkey on the top right there, and that's Ephesus. And I want to take you a tour, on a short tour, to the city of Ephesus. I know because this is not very familiar to you, uh, this ancient city, maybe some of you don't know what Ephesus was like in those days. Maybe you were thinking Ephesus was just an old, dusty town you know, small houses, uh, lots of donkeys, lots of goats, and things like that. Well, you're wrong, because Ephesus was one of the most vibrant cities in the first century. Uh, if you stroll through the city of Ephesus, you would see these amazing, amazing structures all over the place. I want to show you a couple. One of the structures was the Temple of Artemis. This is the Temple of Artemis, also called one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Uh, the footprint of this temple was about the size of a football field. And it, it is, its structure was supported by those, those uh, marble pillars that you, that, that you see on the screen. It had 127 of those marble pillars. And each one, you know how, how high it is? It's uh, 18 meters long. That's how tall it is. It is one of the most magnificent-looking buildings in the first century, the Temple of Artemis. And I want to show you Artemis, also known as the goddess Diana. See, the gods and the goddesses of the first century, they have two names. One is the Roman name. The other one is the Greek name. Uh, this is Artemis or Diana. She is the goddess of fertility, uh, very, very sensual. She has lots and lots of breasts, as you can see from that stature. That is just disturbing. And uh, I don't know who created Diana or Artemis. Must be some guy, you know. If two breasts are good, why not 16? Yeah, yeah. Freaky. Anyway. <laughs> so they worship this goddess called Diana or Artemis, and that temple that you saw was built for her, for her worship. Uh, let me show you another structure. If you think Perth Arena is great, Ephesus also had its amphitheater. This one only seated about 24,000 people. Uh, by comparison, Perth Arena seats about 15,000, so you can imagine how huge this, this structure is, even for the time, you know. Uh, in the first century. There are many other structures that I can't show you one by one. Uh, the other famous one would be the Agora. That's the entranceway. It's like the mall for Ephesus, the size of two football fields. So it's like our Westfield carousel, probably. That's where people go and buy goats, buy slaves, and, and do all those 
stuff, all right? So Paul arrived at Ephesus in around AD 57 to plant churches. And it is interesting how, how the people of Ephesus view Paul's visit. You can read the story in the book of Acts, and I want to read it to you. From Acts chapter 19, starting verse 23, see if you can recognize some of the landmarks that I just showed you, all right? Verse 23, Acts 19. About that time, serious trouble developed in Ephesus concerning the way. That's the code name for Christians. They're known as the way. It began with Demetrius, a silversmith who had a large business manufacturing silver shrines of the Greek goddess Artemis. He kept many craftsmen busy. He called them together along with others employed in, a, in similar trades and addressed them as follows. Gentlemen, you know that our wealth comes from this business. But as you have seen and heard, this man Paul has persuaded many people that handmade gods aren't really gods at all. And he's done this not only in here in Ephesus, but throughout the entire province. Of course, I'm not just talking about the loss of public respect for our business. I'm also concerned that the temple of the great goddess Artemis, that's the reference to the temple, will lose its influence and that Artemis, this magnificent goddess worshipped throughout the province of Asia and all around the world, will be robbed of her great prestige. We're angry, not just because we lose our business, but, you know, this is their pretend reason, because our great god, Artemis will not be worshipped anymore if we allow this man, Paul, to perpetuate this message that statute is not really God at all. Verse 28, at this, their anger boiled and they began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was filled with confusion. Everyone rushed to the amphitheater. There you go. Dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, who were Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. Paul wanted to go in too, but the believers wouldn't let him. So Paul started this church. Probably he began by preaching in the synagogues, in the temple, about how Jesus was the real resurrected one, representing the one true God. And he was there for two years, and his desire being the apostle of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles was to not just stay in one place, but go everywhere to tell people about Jesus. So he left Ephesus in the good hand of one of his students, Timothy. So Timothy became the pastor in Ephesus as Paul traveled about traveling and planting more churches around the area. And about a few years later, Paul wrote this letter that he addressed to the Christians in Ephesus, the letter that we are about to read, and this letter is divided into two halves. There are six chapters, as I told you before. In the first three chapters, Paul speaks nothing about behavior. He speaks only about their identity in Jesus Christ. Now, by this time, as you can imagine living in a big city, a lot of the Christians in Ephesus were, you know, tempted. They were tempted to sin. They were tempted to do the wrong things, and they did do the wrong things. So Paul, instead of just rebuking them, correcting their behavior, for the first three chapters, can you imagine, if you were a CEO of a company, you went away, and then you heard there's a lot of gossiping in your company, there's a lot of stealing in your company, what would you do? You would write an email starting to rebuke everybody, right? You're going to say, hey guys, come on, you got to behave. Don't do this, don't do that, do this, do that. But Paul, instead of rebuking them, instead of just telling them what to do for the first three chapters, Paul just says, remember who you are. Remember who you are. I want you to remember who you are. That's all he says. Remember who you are. I want to tell you. Let me remind you who you are. And then, only then, for the last three chapters, he began with his practical exhortation, telling the people what to do. But he only did that after he made sure that the people understood who they were in Jesus Christ. So this afternoon, I want to ask you, do you know who you are? Who do you think you are? I know a lot of people have their identity all wrapped up uh, around their work. You see, a lot of people, when they are retiring, they have struggled because their whole identity is wrapped up 
in their work. If you're good in sales, maybe your identity is wrapped up in how well you do sales. So when you do well, you know, you feel good about yourself. But when the market is bad, you feel bad about yourself. You know why? Because your whole identity is wrapped up in who you are as a good salesperson. Many of you have your identity wrapped up in how you look. That's why, you know, you have, you have struggle as you age, you know. You're 30 years old, you're becoming 40 years old, 50 years old. You struggle because your whole identity is wrapped up in how you look. Paul says this, if you want to have any chance of living as a Christian in this world, you first got to understand who you are in Jesus Christ. So I want to ask you right now to turn with me to the book of Ephesians from chapter 1, verse 1, as we're going to look at what Paul says about who we are. And there's, there's a lot of, a lot, like I said, this is like amazing, right? In, in the first chapter of Ephesians, if you study the original language, the first 11 verses is one sentence in the Greek. Can you imagine? Paul was so excited about reminding them who they are in Jesus Christ. Paul, like, he couldn't stop. He just said one thing after another, and he says one thing. He starts wonder to another thought. And he said, oh, by the way, and then you are this also. You are this also. So Paul just, he, like, he couldn't get, he couldn't wait to get all of this goodness of who we are in Christ out so that people would understand their true identity in Jesus Christ. So Ephesians 1, verse 1, we're going to look at all the six chapters for the, next, for the next eight hours. So we should be out of here by midnight today. Okay. Ephesians 1, verse 1. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I'm writing to God's holy people in Ephesus. That's the first reminder right there. Guess who I'm writing for, Paul says. I'm not writing to a bunch of sinners. I'm not writing to uh, a bunch of nobodies. I'm writing to God's holy people in Ephesus. I'm telling you right now, church, you're not a dust. You're not a nobody. You are God's holy people. You might not feel that way, but in Christ, you are God's holy people. I know some Christians, when they pray, they pray like this, Oh God, you know, I'm just a dust. I'm nothing. I'm a worm. You know, please forgive this worm. You know, I said, no, don't look at yourself that way. You know, a lot of people ask me this question: Are we are we a sinner who got saved by grace, or are we a saint who sometimes sin? See, both are right, right? I mean, we are a sinner saved by God's grace. But once you are saved by God's grace, I beg you, Paul, beg you to stop looking at yourself as a sinner. If you keep telling yourself, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, next time you sin, you, you feel nothing about it. You, you feel like, that's normal. I'm a sinner. That's my identity. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. What can I do? I can't do anything but sin because that's who I am. But Paul says, no, you are God's holy people in Jesus Christ. So instead of, you know, I'm just a worm God, just say, God, I'm your son. See, I don't understand why I do this. I'm not supposed to do this. That's why I keep telling Jaden again and again. I told you this many times. I never said Jaden is naughty. Every time he did something wrong, I always tell Jaden, Jaden, you're a good boy, but what you did was naughty. I don't want his identity wrapped up in what I said about him, that you are a naughty boy, you're a naughty boy. If I keep saying that, after a while he said, I'm a naughty boy. That's what I do. I do naughty things because... I'm a naughty boy. You understand? you got to understand. It's very important. You think like, oh, it's no big deal. What's the big deal? It's a big deal because how you behave will be like how you think about yourself. Paul says, you are God's holy people who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. And in verse 3, and he starts this amazing, amazing explanation of who we are in Jesus Christ. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Everyone say every. Every spiritual blessing. What does that mean? Paul didn't say every physical blessing. So beware of those health and wealth preachers who says, 
you know, you believe in Jesus, you're going to be wealthy. Uh, God's going to give you all the riches of this world. No. Paul says, you have access to everything now. Every spiritual blessing. Whatever you need, God said, it's yours. It's already done for. You have received free forgiveness in Jesus Christ, complete forgiveness in Him. You have been redeemed, not half redeemed, but redeemed fully by Jesus Christ, you are now God's very own, you know, every spiritual blessing, all the inheritance of heaven is now yours. You know, everything God has is now yours. Every spiritual blessing, Paul says, is now yours. Why? Because we are united with Jesus Christ. What belongs to Christ now belongs to us. The righteousness that belongs to Jesus Christ, guess what? now belongs to you. That's why when God sees you, God sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ in you. In verse 4, he went on, even before he made the world. Everyone say before. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Now, think about this. We can just stop here. and marinate on this verse for the next 15 minutes, and we wouldn't be able to comprehend what Paul says right here. Before he made the world, guess what he did? He already loved you. Isn't that amazing? Before he made the world. That means before the fall, before everything else, God loved us and chose us in Christ. I remember when I was in high school, uh, During PE, you know, uh, during the exercise time, our PE teacher would pick two jocks as, you know, they always do, and then get these two jocks to pick team members. You've been in that situation? Uh, I was not even a Christian at the time, but I I started praying to God, God, please, don't let me be the last person picked. Please, 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 don't let me be the last person picked. You know, I was fat and chubby. I was not very coordinated, you know, and, and sometimes I got picked last. You know, it's not a good feeling when you get picked last, right? Because, of course, the jock would want the sporty one. They would want the tall one. They would want the skinny one uh, to be on their team. Uh, So my prayer to God is always, God, please don't let me be the last one to get picked. We are that chubby kid. We are that uncoordinated kid. The Bible says, before he made the world, before we knew anything, God decided that He's going to love us and choose us to be holy and without fault in His eyes. Can you imagine that? To be holy and without fault in His eyes. Let me ask you, are we full of faults? You betcha, right? We're not holy. We're nowhere near holy. But the Bible says before He made the world, He loved us, chose us to be holy and without fault. In his eyes, as far as God is concerned, when he looks at you, you are without fault. This morning I was arguing with Hulda. You know, I said, Jaden, you are perfect. You know, I didn't, I didn't plan to, to, do, to use this illustration, but I just remembered just now. You know, I said, Jaden, you're just perfect. And Hulda said, no, you're not perfect, but we love you. I said, no, in my eyes, you are perfect. See, I love Jaden more than Hulda loves Jaden. <laughs> I said, in my eyes, you are perfect, Jaden. See, do I know that Jaden's not perfect? Of course I do. You know? Of course I do. He's not perfect, but to me, he is perfect. And that's how God sees you. God says, before he made the world, he loved us, chose us in Christ, and in his eyes, we are without fault. Verse 5, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. In a culture where babies got thrown because of birth defect, because of the wrong sex, Paul says, you know what? God is telling you, He's not going to abandon you. I've decided before the foundation of the world to adopt you, God says. Paul wrote to the believers in Ephesus, reminding them, you know, your most defining moment in your life It's not who threw you out, but who took you in. You might be rejected, Paul says, by people. You might be abandoned as a baby, but as far as God is concerned, 
He wanted you. God decided to adopt you as imperfect, as bad as you are. If you've be, ever been dumped by a girlfriend, a boyfriend, a fiancé, been dumped by a, a spouse, you've been dumped by a company, you know, if you've been let go, right, and you feel rejected, you feel unwanted, God is trying to tell you right now, before He made the world, God decided that He wanted you. God says, I want to adopt you. Why? Why does He do this? This is so good. This is what He wanted to do, and it gave Him great pleasure. It's not like God says, you know, I don't really like you humans, but I'm God, so I got to do what is right, so okay, uh, I'm going to love you. No. The Bible is very clear. Paul is very clear when Paul says, and when Paul says this, this is what he wanted to do. God wanted to do this. It gave him great pleasure. I want to tell you, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are God's holy people. You've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Even before he made the world, God loved us. He chose us in Christ to be holy without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. Why? Can you imagine in these two short verses, Paul just blurred out all this goodness of being united with Jesus Christ. Why? In Deuteronomy 7, verse 7, which I'm sure Paul was very familiar with, God spoke to Israel and said, you know why I chose you? I chose you not because you are greater than any other nations. I chose you not because you have more horses than any other nations. I chose you not because you are stronger than any other nations. I chose you, God says, I wanted to adopt you, not because you're smarter than everybody else, not because you're cuter than everybody else, not because you're more intelligent than everybody else. In fact, God says, Israel, you are the weakest of all nations. You are the worst. In fact, God says to us, you're the ugliest. You're one of the worst. Paul says, none of us, when we were saved, are of uh, honorable background. But God decided to adopt us. God decided that he wanted, he wanted us. And let me tell you, He did it gladly. It gave Him great pleasure to do this. Uh, one of my favorite authors, uh, Ravi Zacharias, wrote this book called Why Jesus? And he told this story about his two friends who started this orphanage that specializes in, in taking care of uh, physically defect babies who were unwanted by the parents. So they took them in, and, and they tried to fix them, whatever they can fix, they tried to fix the physical defects, and, and tried to get parents to adopt these kids. And there was one little boy in, in their orphanage um, who had always been passed over for adoption uh, because he had a particular brain malfunction. You know, he's not all uh, up there in his mind. Uh, that is very rare, you know, brain disease. He often doesn't connect uh, a lot of thoughts together. At about nine years of age, um, this boy, you know, even though he's not all up there, even though his thoughts were all disconnected, he realized that one by one, his friends started leaving the orphanage. So he started asking this question, why didn't anybody choose me? Why was no one adopting me? Um, through an incredible series of events, this couple, you know, tried their hardest to call everyone they knew to try to get them to adopt this boy. Finally, one couple from Texas decided they already adopt, adopted one baby from this orphanage, also disabled. And out of the blue, they just called and said, hey, is that boy who were mentally disabled, is he still there? And then the couple said, yeah, he's still here. So they work out uh, a special arrangement uh, for this couple from Texas. And finally, they, they brought him home. And uh, one of the things that happened when this boy was adopted, um, his actual name was actually hard to pronounce. So the parents from Texas decided to give him an English name. 
uh, another name. And they gave him a name, Anson Josiah, AJ for short. And this is in the word of Rav, Rav, Ravi Zacharias. Um, AJ, after he was adopted, walked around at that home waiting for his new parents to come for him, telling everybody as he points to his chest, my name is AJ. You can call me AJ, he said. And Ravi wrote this. Is it not interesting that even with the debilitation of disconnected thoughts, he, this boy, is able to pick up the redeeming thrill of relationship, his profound worth as evidence in his new name. You know, for him, being called AJ began a new, a whole new identity. Now he belongs to someone. Now he means something. And to him, that's the greatest thrill of all. Paul went on to say this in verse 6. So we praise God for the glorious grace He has poured out on us who belong to His dear Son. Verse 7, He is so rich in kindness and grace that He purchased our freedom. Everyone say purchased. Purchased our freedom with the blood of His Son and forgave our sins. He has showered His kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. This is the next image that I want you to get into your head. The image of redemption. It's the image of redemption. Uh, the term sounds like a heavy theological term, but actually it's an economic term. Redemption simply means you are purchased. Redemption simply means that, you know, if you are a slave and you're in a market, somebody purchase you, somebody redeem you. If you walk to the market in Ephesus, you came across a slave. Say you came and approached him and you asked this slave, hey, tell me your story. How did you end up here? This slave will tell you, I belong to Cornelius or some name. And then you ask again, tell me how that happened. Well, I was a baby. I was abandoned by my parents. And then this couple took me off the street, raised me up until I was about 12, brought me to the market, and sold me as a slave. And Cornelius, my master, bought me when I was 13, I was 12, 13, and now I've been his slave ever since. I do whatever Cornelius says. That's who I am. And that's my story. Oh, that's very interesting. How much did he pay for you? And then this slave said, oh, I, I, was, I was a strong young man. I was taller, stronger than everybody else. The bid went up as high as 25 silver coins. That's how much I was worth, you know, proudly saying it to you how much he's worth. That's what redeem means. You actually purchase someone at a price so that that person now belongs to you. Paul says, God, through Jesus Christ, has redeemed you. God purchased you, not as a slave, but God purchased you from the slavery of sin through Jesus Christ. And now you belong to Him. Guess how much do you think you're worth? If that slave is worth about 20, 25 silver pieces, you know, silver coins, how much do you think you're worth? What kind of price would God pay for you to redeem you, you think? Paul tells us all about it. We are bought not with silver, not with gold, but we are bought with a price, a precious price, and that price is the very blood of Jesus Christ himself. So that's another image. Not only were you chosen by God, not only were you now God's holy people, now God redeemed you, God purchased you, and God forgave you from all your past mistakes, present and even future, and that's who you are. That's who you are. And then lastly, I skip to verse 13. Uh, Paul says, and when you believe in Christ, He identified you as His own. In another translation, it says, you are marked with a seal. Marked with a seal by giving you the Holy Spirit whom He promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that He will give us the inheritance He promised and that He has purchased us to be His own people. And He did this so we would praise and glorify Him. God has sealed you. 
He had not only redeemed you, He purchased you, but to make it all legal, to make it all like official. Bible says, now you are marked with a seal. What is a seal? One type of seal is the, whoop, 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 whoop. that's a seal. Uh, that's not a seal that we're talking about, okay? Uh, another type of seal is uh, the ex-husband of Heidi Klum. That's a seal. That's not the kind of seal. But when you write a letter, right, to make the letter official, you put that letter with a seal of your own initial to say to people that this is really your letter. This letter belongs to you. It's a seal, right? Uh, when you have a herd of cows, for example, you know, you want to seal these cows to tell people that these cows belong to you. You can't put uh, like a wax seal. So what you do is you brand the cows. You brand them with, with, uh, with hot plates, you know, and then mark this cow as, as yours. That's what it means to be sealed, right? And that's what God says. God says, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. You have been bought with a price, and now there's a mark on your life to say that you belong to God. How many of you have seen the movie The Gladiator with Russell Crowe? Uh, Russell Crowe is, uh, of course, he's one of the uh, top-ranking officials in the Roman Empire, and every Roman uh, soldier were also marked with a seal. I don't know if you pay attention to the movie, but on the, on the bicep of Russell Crowe, there was a, a tattoo uh, mark that he belongs to the Roman Empire. The tattoo says SPQR, SPQR. That's an initial to tell the world that, hey, I'm a Roman soldier. I belong to the Roman Empire. Paul says, you know, we have been sealed, not with the man-made seal, but we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. Church, let me just conclude by saying this. If you ever doubted if God loves you, if you ever, because of your sins, because of your imperfection, maybe you think, man, I'm such a lousy Christian. I wonder if God can ever forgive me again. Uh, if you ever wonder if you could be something even more than what you already are right now, if you wonder, you know, is there hope for me as a Christian in this world? I'm telling you, go back, read Ephesians chapter 1 slowly. In fact, read 1 to 3, right? And soak yourself with what God says about you instead of telling yourself what you say about yourself, all right? Because what God says about you is what matters. What you say, what others say about you, they don't really matter. In fact, if they don't agree with what God says about you, they, they do you more damage than good. So rather than believing in what you say, why not instead turn to the Word of God and then just meditate on those truths? Before God even made the world, He chose you. He's decided beforehand. Before knowing whether you're going to be good, you're going to be bad, you're going to be awesome for Him, you're going to disappoint Him. Before He knew all that, God says, I've already made up my mind. I've already decided to love you. I've already decided to choose you, to adopt you into my family. How good is that? How good is that? For those of you who think you can please God by your performance, I'm telling you, God already chose you before He knew that you could do something for Him. For those of you who think that you disappoint God over and over and over again, God chose you and made you holy blameless in His sight before you had any chance to disappoint Him. How good is that? That's not my word. This is God's word. So, if you want to have any hope of living a meaningful life in this world, doing something great for God, and I believe each one of us is meant to be a hero for God's kingdom. We are meant for something more in this world. We're not just here to take up space. But before you even begin to do anything, thinking about doing anything for God, you got to go back and ask yourself, do I know who I really am in Jesus Christ? Do I know who I really am? Because next time that challenge comes again, next time that temptation, that disappointment comes again, you don't want to 
be in this situation where you're always up and down. Sometimes you are secure when you're good and you're insecure when you're bad. And then you are secure again when you decide to repent and do uh, what God says to do. And then you're insecure again because you realize that you can never live up to that expectation. Man, I'm telling you, that's not how we're meant to live. That's going to be <laughs> dis- disappointing if you think that's Christianity. That's why a lot of Christians, they keep going through this cycle, you know, this cycle of commitment. Yes, God, I want to commit. And then for a while, they did well, and then they came to the, came to the next stage, is, which is condemnation. Oh, man, I'm so bad. I'm so lousy. And then they go to a next, the next stage again, recommitment. Okay, I'm going to commit my life again to God. I'm going to do right this time. And then for a while, you did okay, and then you condemn yourself again. That's not how to live. That's not how you live, right? Be secure in who you are in Jesus Christ. And then from that moment on, once you know who you are, I'm not saying that everybody, everything is going to be easy from this moment on, that you're not going to have any struggle. But let me tell you, once you're secure in who you are, you're going to realize, hey, it's not so bad. What I used to struggle with, I actually find the strength to do it now. I actually want to do it now. It's not a burden anymore. Suddenly, it's a joy. Suddenly, it's a delight to come to church. It's a delight to serve. It's a delight, you know, to give, to do all the things that God called you to do, to be a hero in His kingdom. I want to get the worship team to come back forward uh, to the stage. They're going to sing this song. It's a great song by Casting Crowns. I want to read you the lyrics of this song. It's called, Who Am I? And I want you to use this song as a song of reflection. Just to let the Word of God that you just heard to soak in into your life. The lyric says, Who am I that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name, would care to feel my hurt? And then the verse, the chorus says, Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. Let's listen to this song as we reflect on God's love and God's goodness in our lives. You know, because of the seal of the Holy Spirit that God gave to each one of you, you can be confident. The seal is God saying to you, you're mine. You are mine. You are mine forever. Why don't we say it out loud? He adopted me. He adopted me. He paid for me. He paid for me. I'm his. I am his. One more time. He adopted me. He adopted me. He purchased me. He purchased me. He forgave me. He forgave me. I'm his. I am his. I'm his. I am his. God, you adopted me. You paid for me. You paid for me. I'm yours. I am yours. I'm yours. I am yours. Forever. Forever. Father in heaven, that is the truth. That is the truth. Whatever we may say about ourselves, whatever people say about ourselves, what matters to us is what you say about us. God, you're just so amazing. And Lord, we can spend our whole lifetime just trying to comprehend this love, this grace. Like a song that we often sing, Lord. If your grace is an ocean, we're all sinking in it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you are a good God. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on our behalf. Giving us the complete forgiveness. Thank you for marking us with the seal of the Holy Spirit. Telling us and telling the whole world that we belong to you forever. Father, I pray for every single person here. Especially those of us who always have this doubt about whether or not you like us about whether or not you accepted us. May these words that we just 
heard, put all that to rest. May we return to this gem of truth again and again and again. That you are our Father because of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. I pray, I pray for every single person here who do not yet know you. Who do not yet accept it. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ at the cross. I pray that you will speak to them, Lord. In the quietness of their heart, I pray that you make yourself known as real to them. Because you are real. Thank you, Jesus. I pray that every single person here will just stop trying harder, but let's all believing better. Thank you, Lord. Church, as we go from this place, I pray that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God that has loved you before He created the world, the God that has chosen you before you knew right from wrong, may the God of the Holy Spirit who live inside of you give you the strength, the reminder that you belong to Him forever, regardless of what you do. And may you take this message to your heart. And may you live your life to please God. Not because you have to, but because you want to. That you desire nothing more than to please Him. Just like Paul did for the rest of your life. Until Jesus Christ comes again, even forevermore. And all God's people who are blessed, sit together with me. Amen. Amen. God bless you, everybody. I'll see you all next week.